worship you. Come see what love has done. Amazing. He bought us with his blood. Our Savior, the cross has overcome. We worship you.
You came for criminals and every Pharisee. You came for hypocrites, even one like me. You carried sin and shame, the guilt of every man, the weight of all I've done, nailed into your hands. Oh, your love bled for me, oh, your blood in crimson streams. turn your attention to Luke chapter 3 and we're going to consider the life of John the Baptist and look at a principle that that I see represented uh, in his life and in his ministry that I think uh, has application to our lives and as we talk about John the Baptist one of the exciting moments on that trip is we will have a morning when we will go to the place uh, at the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized by John and you will have the opportunity, those of you who are on the trip, to be baptized in the River Jordan. Uh, we went in February the last time. It was mild weather, but I promise you the Jordan River wasn't anything but mild. That's the coldest water I've ever stepped into in all of my life. I baptized seven people, and then Ron Freed baptized me. And our tour guide said, Ron, I, I went ahead and took it upon myself to reserve you a wetsuit. And I thought, oh, Lord, i got to get in a wetsuit. And so, but I am so glad because there's no way I could have survived baptizing seven people in that cold water without, without being in a wetsuit. And, 
And uh, it's a tremendous moment uh, to, to have that opportunity. Let's pray together. Father, as we look at the scripture today, and we look particularly at your servant, John the Baptist, we pray that uh, you would show us individually why this message is the message that you laid upon my heart to share with our church family today. Uh, Lord, I pray that each and every one may glean from this message exactly what you have uh, for us individually, because I want to thank you, Lord, this morning that even though we are a a large group of people gathered here. Lord, you are meeting with us one by one as if we are the only one in the room. And we need that, Lord. We need your hand upon our lives. Uh, we thank you for the salvation that has been purchased by the pouring out of Jesus' blood. Lord, we know that if it were not for him, we would not be saved. And we pray that as we look to John and we see his ministry as represented in Luke 3, that we might understand for ourselves uh, how important it is that we uh, know who we are in the kingdom and that we know who you are in the kingdom and that we would be able to distinguish between the two so that we might have the fulfillment that you have for us and the peace that you have for us. That, Lord, we might sense the purpose that is ours even as John sensed his purpose in his day. So, Lord, quicken your word. Bring it to life in us, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in, John, in Luke chapter 3, John uh, comes on the scene. Uh, remember, he is a, uh, a gift from God to Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, born to them in their uh, old age. And he has a very specific purpose as he comes onto the scene. God intended for John to serve as the one who would prepare the people for the advent of of, of Jesus' ministry. Now, Jesus has been upon the earth for some 30 years when this, is, when this is unfolding. So some time has gone by from Luke chapter 2 to Luke chapter 3. And John has a specific role, and he understands that role. And it makes a difference in him giving himself to the task that, that is his in the midst of the kingdom ministry. If you look at Luke 3, 16 you find John uh, sharing with the people his understanding of what his role is and how he is in relationship with Jesus. He says, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than me will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And in those words... As we, as we read in between the lines of what is being said there, we can come to an understanding that, that about his life that actually makes a difference in our lives. And there's three things I want to talk to you about today. One is knowing who we are and what our work as individuals in the kingdom is all about. Two, knowing who Jesus is and what his purpose is as he gives himself to his messianic role in the midst of, of, of all ages. And then finally... Uh, Lord, help us to avoid cookie-cutter mentality when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to being disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Discipleship is what we're called to. Not just an easy believism, not just a quick decision that, that we want uh, a fire insurance policy that will keep us from the flames of hell. Certainly we want that. No, nobody wants to be punished forever because of our sin. All of us want that salvation that Jesus is offering. It's just a matter of coming to, to, to terms with accepting that according to, to His design for our lives. But who wants to burn forever? Nobody. Um, and so we want the salvation that br Jesus brings. Jesus says that those who are serious about receiving Him into their lives have got to come to this place. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. So you can see that's not just easy believism. That's not just a decision that's made on a Sunday morning or on a Tuesday evening in your living room, but it is a lifelong decision that impacts all of, of our days. If, if we are going to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and receive the blessing that he is wanting to bring to our lives, then there's, there's some involvement there for us that's very crucial and very important uh, to us being, being Christians. In 1982, Becky's parents decided to move to South Carolina. Becky and, and, and myself were in Columbia. Uh, we had Tommy. Christy was a newborn uh, or toddler. And, uh, and then Becky's brother, Tom, had moved to the Columbia area. Uh, he had two children. His first wife was killed tragically in a, in a car accident on their way home from church one Sunday morning. And, uh, and so he remarried a girl from the, from the Columbia Church, and he moved up with his family to Columbia. So Holmes and Molly decided that uh, most of their family was here, and it was time for them to, to make a move, so they moved uh, to the Columbia area. Holmes decided to build a house in Elgin. And the thing that brings us to my mind today, uh, we went over to Powers Funeral Home for a, for a visitation yesterday evening, and we were running a bit early, so we went and found Holmes and Molly's house that they built uh, on Highway Church Road in, in Elgin, South Carolina. And man, it brought back a flood of memories. The old dirt road that turns off a of Highway Church and goes all the way back to the edge of the woods where Holmes built uh, a little house for he and Molly. And uh, we thought about times that we shared together there as a family. And one of the things that I remembered is I remembered that on two days a week, my on the days that I had off, I would go and work with Holmes as he worked on the house. And uh, Holmes was a master carpenter. Uh, I mean, he just had skills. And it was a pleasure to work with him because I learned so much just by being in his shadow and, and being uh, a helper to him as he did the work that, that I, I could not possibly do, but I could hand him a tool. You know, I could hand him a measuring tape, or I could help him hold a straight, straight edge, or I could help hold a, a piece of wood as, as he ripped a piece of, of board out of a larger piece of material. I could do those things. I was his disciple in that. I, I was in his shadow. I, I followed him everywhere he went on those days that I worked with him. And over time, I began to anticipate what he would need next when he was working. If he was hanging, if he was putting the door frame up, I knew that pretty soon he's going to ask for the combination square or in just a second he's going to need the level or, or, or whatever uh, as, as he moves something out that's, that's uh, been put too far, he's going to need the flat bar. And, and I began to anticipate what he would need and we had a, just a neat working relationship because he said, you have the tool in your hand before I ask for it. And I said, well, the only reason I do is because of all those days that you shouted at me about what tool you needed next. And, I, you know, you, you learn quick. It's like, man, I'm tired of him shouting. And so I began to in anticipate, but it took time. It took following in his footsteps, it being at his side. But it also took this, to understand what I needed to touch and what I needed to back off from because if I rushed in and tried to help him straighten the board, he might look at me and say, what are you doing? And so over time, I understood what my part was. And I understood what his role was. I was the helper. I was the hand it to him guy. He was the master carpenter. I was not that. But I became a good helper because I understood that my role was to be his helper and not take his place as the master carpenter. Now what's this got to do with this morning's passage? Really everything. Because John understood, as the people were asking him, are you the Messiah that was promised? His ego could have got in the way and, and he could have taken unto himself a, maybe a, a, a more of a shade of importance than belonged to him, but he quickly answered and said, no, I'm not him. I am the one who is to be the forerunner of the Messiah. I am the one who is to draw your attention to the fact that he is about to come onto the scene. I am the one who is to show you that God is about to do something that only can happen through his son, Jesus Christ, but I'm just the one who's announcing what's about to happen. I'm the one who is here to announce the main event, and the main event is Jesus Christ. 
He said, I baptize with water. But when He comes into your midst, He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. My role is external. I'm just telling you the time is coming. He is going to reach into your very soul and bring a breath of life that nobody before has been able to bring to your experience. You've had religion, but He's about to give you life. You've had a routine, but He's about to open eternity for you. I'm not Him, but He's on His way. And as I was looking at the words of John, and I was thinking about the dynamic of what was happening, I thought, Lord, it is so important for us to understand who we are and what our work is about. As followers of Jesus Christ, to understand that, yes, we have a place ordained by God Himself. It goes further than that. I have a place. You as individuals have a place. We are not all alike in our discipleship. One is designed to play one role and another is designed to play a completely different role, but one role is not more important than the other. Each and every one crucial to what God is doing in the kingdom. There would be people who would look at John the Baptist and say, of all the people who serve the interests of the kingdom, he is the most important. And God would say, no, he is very important, but every one was important. Zechariah and Elizabeth were important as the parents of, of John raised him to be the man that God would have him to be. Everyone has a role. Everyone is important to what God is wanting to accomplish in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. Do you realize that today there is not another person who has ever inhabited this planet or will inhabit this planet who is just like you? You say, oh, but I I come from triplets. I come from twins. And since you do, you know more than anyone else that even triplets and twins and quintuplets and all the rest of multiple siblings, they understand their uniquenesses better than anyone. There's no one else who has ever lived or will ever live who is just like you. Similarities? Absolutely. Likenesses? Oh, yes. Even John the Baptist was likened unto and answered really the call to walk in the footsteps of Elijah, the great Old Testament prophet. Who was Elijah? He was the one who reminded people of how important it was to be in relationship with God and reminded them what a mess they were making of their lives whenever they walked away from God and His purpose for their lives. As a matter of fact, on one occasion... When Elijah came into the company of King Ahab, Ahab said, O troubler of Israel, what do you have to do with me now? And that's exactly how he saw him. He saw him as as the one who's going to just stir up conviction. The conviction was already there, but Elijah came to remind them how important it was that they recognize God in their lives. And John was born in the spirit of Elijah. He was like a New Testament Elijah, like him, but not him, because there was no one who ever walked the planet just like John the Baptist, or just like Elijah. Knowing who you are and your place in the kingdom is crucial. But then also knowing who Jesus is and what His purpose is in the working out of the dynamics of the kingdom ministry is invaluable as well. John said, there is one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I can't do that for anyone. You can't do that for anyone. We understand how important it is that our lives be immersed in the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. We understand the command of Jesus as it was delivered to His disciples. In the first chapter of Acts, he said, Terry, in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. 
And when the Spirit comes upon you, then you will be my witnesses to the uttermost parts of the earth. But you must have that indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit to be the people that you need to be to fulfill your kingdom role. Only Jesus can baptize people with the Holy Spirit. You can't teach people that. You can teach them about it. You can speak to the importance of that issue. But only God can come down on a person's life, come down on your life, and bring the fullness of the Spirit of God to realization in your life. Only God can do that. John the Baptist understood that. Why is it important that we understand that? Because if we're not careful, we'll think that we can teach a class and once a person goes through six sessions, they'll come out on the other end being baptized in the power of the Spirit. They may or they may not. The class may bring awareness, but only God can bring the baptism. And so when we understand that, we begin to, we begin to find satisfaction in the role that God has given us. And we begin to understand that, that discipleship is not an assembly line. Discipleship is not one size fits all. Discipleship doesn't happen in a, in a set matter of time or in, in a course. Discipleship is daily. Discipleship is continuing. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's God's business. We pray for that. We long for that. He said He'll baptize you with fire. There's a cleansing, there's an empowering that God can bring to our lives, and that's what the fire stands for in this context. There's, there's, there's a fire that God can bring to our lives that we cannot bring to each other's lives. Let me tell you something. As we come together for church on Sunday, it's not only important that we have a program in mind or things would be so disorganized, it is more important that we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in a, in a church service like this this morning. Because we can have church and not be changed whatsoever. But if we have the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place, we can't help but be changed one direction or another because of His living presence being poured out in our lives. So what does that tell us about coming together from week to week in this place? We need to pray all week long as those who gather in this place that God would show up as His people are gathered in His house. That this would be a God event, not a, not a praise team event, not a preacher event, not just a socialization of people, but that, that spiritual power would be poured out in this place because of God's holy presence in His house. Without that, we're having a meeting, but nobody's receiving fire. And I can tell you this morning, as this message is, is being declared, the devil's doing everything he can to fight it. Because he knows what, what's being talked about this morning is the difference between playing church and being the church. John understood, I'm to bring your attention to Jesus, but then what happens in your relationship with Jesus is between you and Him. We've all had those occasions as we've shared the Lord with family and friends. And it's obvious that there's a need for something spiritual to happen in, in all of our lives, and we pray, Lord, please be with, with my neighbor, be with my coworker, be with my family member who's go, just going through it. Lord, they need you. And we pray for them to come to that personal realization of who Jesus is and what He's wanting to do in their lives. But in the final analysis, when we've prayed for them and we've, we've talked to them about Jesus and the reality of what He's done in our lives and what he, the possibilities of what He can do in their lives, when we've done that, we've done, we've done our part. We, we don't have the power as individuals to save anyone. We don't have the power to change anyone on the inside. 
Jesus does. John said, I'm not even worthy to kneel down, to stoop down and untie the sandals of the one who's coming. Compared to him, I'm nothing. But I am that something that God has called me to be because what you really need is the touch of Jesus on your life. And John understood the difference. And we need to understand the difference because I tell you, the devil wants us to be busy trying to change people rather than praying that Jesus will change them. In John 21, verse 22, Jesus has come to the end of his is coming to the end of his interaction with with Peter. He has spoken words of restoration. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Commentators say that Jesus asked him three times and gave him three opportunities to declare his love each time to cover one of the denials that had happened just days earlier. Jesus wanted Peter to know you are fully forgiven, you are fully restored. I know how broken you are over that denial. And so Jesus has called Peter to feed the sheep to take care of the lambs, talking about those who will be gathered to Christ as as the flock of God's people. And Peter points to John, who's just close by, and said, well, what about him? Isn't that just like us? The Lord says, Ron, I want you to go visit sister so-and-so and go take care of this and go take care of that and do this and I'm looking toward Philip's office and I'm saying well what about him and Jesus will say to me what he said to Peter look at this John 21 22 if I want him to remain alive until I return what is that to you you must follow me Lord, what about him? Don't worry about him. You follow me. You know, worrying about the other guy is what's getting in the way of our discipleship sometimes. We, we, I, we need to worry more about following Jesus than how They're following Jesus. Discipleship means that someone has become a personal follower of one who is respected or revered in whatever capacity of life. I told you, working with my father-in-law, I was his disciple. He was the carpenter, I was his helper. I valued his skills. I I helped him and hung out with him. One, I just wanted to help him, but the other reason was I learned so much from him. Little handy tasks that I do around the house now are so much easier to accomplish because I had the opportunity to watch him, to help him, to learn from him. Discipleship is following after someone. Not just reading about them, not just talking about them, following them. And when it comes to being followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, it means that we, in the power of the Spirit, want what He wants. It means that we walk away from what He would walk away from because we're disciples. Discipleship means that someone has committed himself or herself to learning what it means to live based on the values and the behaviors of another person. Committed. 
what would Jesus do? In this situation, what would Jesus do? Dealing with this person, what would Jesus do? Having been told off like I've just been told off, what would Jesus do in response? And disciples are studying the life of Jesus and listening to the cues of the Spirit that we might, that we might, do what Jesus would do as his followers, as his disciples. But there's no such thing as cookie-cutter discipleship. That's why discipleship is bigger than going through a class. A class might be helpful in positioning us for discipleship, but listen, discipleship is what happens tomorrow when it's just you in the middle of life and something happens and now you have to decide Am I going to do what the world would do or am I going to do what Jesus would do in this given moment at this, at this juncture in my life? I have two brothers. Jeff, who's the next in line. He's nine years younger than me. And Wes, who's 12 years younger than me. And tomorrow's his birthday. The three of us were Bauer boys. And we have some lightness that is attached to our dad, Charles Bauer. We all have things about us that can be traced to Charles Bauer. And yet, Jeff and I, we're not that much alike. And Wes and I are not that much alike. And Jeff and Wes, not that much. We, are, we have similarities. We have likeness that is related to the fact that Charles Bauer is our father and we're Bauer boys and we carry resemblance because of that connection. But we're not Charles Bauer and I'm not Jeff and I'm not Wes and they're not me. cannot tell you how important the implications are when it comes to getting that concerning our discipleship and our relationship with Jesus. There are some of you here today who carry a heavy burden for evangelism. There are others of you who carry a heavy burden for youth ministry and others who carry a heavy burden for children's ministry and others who have a, have a torch for missions and others who, who want to see us have exactly the kind of facilities that we need to house what it is that God has for us to accomplish in our times of gathering. We all want that because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, but we are all unique in that God has wired us in certain ways. And what I, what, I want to, what I want to end with today is this. You need to be the follower that Jesus wants you to be, even if it looks different from another Christian you admire. Being a Christian doesn't mean we are like each other. We are related through the blood of Christ. But we are uniquely the follower that God would have us to be. There was no one else who played exactly the role at exactly the time that John played the role he did. And he was good with that and God ordained it. So here's the takeaway. Do you want to follow Jesus? And will you allow the Holy Spirit to dictate in your life what following Jesus for you really means? This is a full-time discipleship. It's not just a Sunday thing. It's a day after day. Opening this book, allowing His truth to invade our lives, to invade our minds and our spirits. It's a continuing prayer. Lord, show me the way you would have me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll say whatever you want me to say. Lord, I want to be your follower. 
I want to be your helper when it comes to the kingdom ministry. I don't want to just take another class. Lord, I want to have a relationship with you that is baptized by the Holy Spirit and is represented by the fire that you're wanting to bring to my life. The passion, the cleansing, the power. I baptize you with water, John said, but one who is more powerful than me will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Let's pray. Lord, I, I really believe there are people here today who have been coming to church but who have not submitted themselves to be your disciples. May your Holy Spirit be poured out in this place at this time in such a way that those you are calling to discipleship would hear your call and then get up and follow you. I pray, Lord, for for you to do a work in our lives that can only be traced to your hand. That, Lord, we might in the days to come be able to see that you alone have called us out of darkness into light, have delivered us from death to life, have quickened our minds that we begin to see things in the Scripture that we've never seen before, begin to do things that Jesus would do, things we've never done before. Lord, I pray that it will be traced to the baptism of Your Holy Spirit in our lives. May Your holy fire burn away everything that needs to be removed from our lives, that we might be filled up with You that we might live in relationship with you in such a way that it brings a fulfillment to our lives that we've never found in anything else at any time in our lives. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The altars are open. I need to pray about it. Oh. 
Oh. 